Yes. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Welcome back. It's Roy and Val. And we're going to talk to you today about soldering. We've been doing some previous uh, videos or demonstrations on, on the copper foil technique of stained glass. And we did grinding and fitting your piece and foiling last time. So now we wanted to cover soldering. Uh, we, I don't know if you can notice anything different about us, but we have a couple of um, microphones attached to our shirts. We heard some, we got some feedback uh, last time about uh, some issues about hearing us or the sound level. So we're experimenting this week with these microphones. So hopefully you can hear us well. Uh, you know, let us know if the sound's not good. Uh, you can always you know, make a comment in the section below. So, um, but otherwise we're gonna probably, We're gonna go with it. We're gonna go with yeah. it. If we start to hear some really weird noise, we'll try to shut it down. But otherwise, I think we're, we're good. So, uh, and again, while we're um, demonstrating or talking, if you have questions, you know, send us a message on Facebook or Instagram, or again, make a comment in the section below. So, soldering. The, we have this kind of setup here where I already have my iron plugged in, and um, we uh, have some other different irons sitting up here on the table that Kaylee can show you. They're just, you know, they all work. Uh, they just do slightly different things. Um, the particular soldering iron I'm using today is made by Weller. It's a Weller 100, it's called. It's 100 watt. Usually we recommend something close to 100 watts, you know, when you're soldering. Uh, this particular soldering iron has a built-in thermostat and what that does is regulate the temperature so the thinking is as I'm soldering you lose heat through the tip and the iron will automatically kick back up to kind of keep that same temperature of 750 degrees or, I'm sorry 700 degrees it's really nice I mean the only sort of negative thing is we can't control the temperature by plugging it into a rheostat or um, one of those, which we don't seem to which have. Seem to not brought one with us, okay, but, um, but anyways, and this, and this one, one here is made by Hako. Uh, it also has a built-in thermostat, but it does also have a dial on the it's handle, so we can control the temperature. So if you're doing lead cane, for example, or maybe some decorative soldering, you might want to alter the temperature a little bit. This one on the far right is a hundred watt um, soldering iron, and it needs a rheostat, which you would plug into, think of it as like a dimmer switch, and what it basically does is dial down the electricity, so then we can dial down the temperature of the iron, because you might find that particular soldering iron a it little fluctuates too much. hot. Yeah, yeah, it fluctuates a lot, and sometimes it's a little too hot to work with, um, especially if you're a beginner or you're um, kind of new at soldering. Mm -hmm. So this one really, right, the Weller 100, yep. that tends to be the nice user-friendly one for people just starting out. Because sometimes you can get yourself a little bit confused by turning the rheostat up and down. By the time it actually responds to what you've done to it, you maybe thought it wouldn't and you turn it up. People can get themselves in kind of a problem by messing with those. And this one does work really well for all general type of stuff. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I think like as Val was mentioning, you know, Val and I teach some of the um, classes here, stained glass classes, and we think, especially for beginners or students, this iron is nice because you don't have to worry about it. You pretty much just plug it in and, and it's always going to be the right temperature for doing copper foil work anyways. Yeah. So I'm going to uh, do a little bit of um, soldering demonstration here. And, but first, uh, I want to show you that, that we have the soldering iron in one of these stands, which is a really nice way of kind of keeping your iron close by and handy, but also it's a safety thing, so it's not resting too close to the table. Um, it can't roll onto something. I mean, it, it, it's a nice, it's really a nice thing to have. You really should have some sort of holder instead of just the little disc that it comes yeah, with that it sort of when you teeters on. Yeah, that's yeah, kind of not that. that safe. So we'll, 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 start, we'll finish talking about safety a tiny bit, I guess. I mean, I think the obvious thing is the temperature of the iron. I've mentioned a couple times that this particular iron's at 700 degrees. And so the handle obviously is not 700, but but from here, so the barrel on down to the tip, you know, from here on down is 700 degrees. So, uh, you know, you don't want to have to grab that. And again, the advantage to a stand like this is it does keep all of that away from where you might be tempted to grab it, right? It puts it right here for us to uh, be able to access the iron. The, um, we're going to talk about the actual solder in just a minute or so here, and then we'll talk about some of the safety about dealing with solders, um, especially the ones that contain lead. Uh, but uh, let me show you the proper technique for holding the soldering iron. So when I'm gonna soldering, I like to hold it like this. I'd say like the handles of a motorcycle or a... I say a bicycle. Oh, that's a bicycle, sorry. Um, or a screwdriver. 
right? It's not a paintbrush or pencil kind of thing. The reason why we want to hold it flat in our hand like this is because when we're soldering, you can see how close I can get the iron to the to my panel, and it just makes it easier to cover the solder seams that way. Mm -hmm. If I hold it like this, you see the angle now of the soldering just iron. Basically, yeah, that and you corner. got just this little tiny bit of the tip there that's covering. And um, I don't know if you're like me, but when I'm soldering, you know, my goal is always to put down one. I see it. One, <laughs> one seam of solder, and um, not have to go back. We just noticed that we didn't. I, I was in there's one piece here that uh, didn't get boiled, so I'm so, step over here. You know, it seems pretty common in the yeah, right? the way we, the way we prepare. especially a panel like this with so many pieces. It's kind of <laughs> to, to forget oh. to foil something. Um, so when you watch me, I'm going to be periodic. I'll be holding the iron, hopefully like this. The other thing I want to point out real quick too about the stand is that there's just you can tell this one's been used a little bit, right? But do you see the sponge here? So we put water on the sponge. Because also while I'm soldering, I'm going to periodically wipe the tip of the iron on the sponge. And what this is going to do is keep the tip nice and clean. So what we need is the tip to be really nice and shiny and silver looking. If it's dull, the solder won't really grab onto it. And we're going to pick up some, as we're soldering, we'll pick up some impurities from the solder. We'll pick up the, you know, the flux will burn and that can sometimes leave some some residue on the tip of the soldering iron and we want to get that off. And, and so again, while I'm soldering, I usually just come in and, and wipe the tip off in all sides of it, you know, as I'm working. And then, so get the sponge really wet. You know, I know sometimes as we were talking earlier and, and, and people sometimes are hesitant because they're like, well, I'm, I have an iron that's plugged in with electricity, you know. You were always taught to not to stick water. that anything plugged in into water, and right? You want me to dump a lot of water on that sponge, but get it really nice and wet. You should hear the sponge hiss at you you know, when you're wiping it on there, that'll let you know you have enough um, enough water in the sponge. So I want to. So we use flux brushes around here. I mean, it, I, I, I like these because they're not overly expensive, and you know they're going to get bad, and you can just toss them when they're when they're no good. I mean, you can use other kinds of little small paint brushes if you like, but uh, these are specifically designed for doing uh, flux. Now this is how they come when they're brand new, and if you can see the length of them, you know, ever since I've been doing this, one of the things I always do is um, trim back the bristles of the brush. And I can tell you it's really just more of a, um, a reason that, what it helps me with actually is not have as much flux on the not brush, to carry right? so much flux. Yeah, because I think what sometimes the issue that people have is they use too much flux. And, and when we're soldering, since we're talking about, you know, safety a little bit, right? since we're talking about safety, um, you know, we're burning off that flux, right, while we're soldering. And to me, I think that's probably sometimes the bigger issue. You don't really want, that's not something you want to breathe in. So my goal always is to try to use as small amount of flux as possible. And one reason why is because you can just add more. So if you find that, you know, you don't have enough flux and the solder's not flowing well, it, I mean, it's easy to just dip the brush in and add a little more flux. Well, if you have too much flux, all you're going to do is burn it off. And yeah. And then you can and that can cause it to bubble, the solder to bubble and pop and spit. And so too much isn't a good thing. So and you can always wipe it off if that happens. And yep. it's not like you've ruined it, but you'll know if you have too much, you'll have to kind of wipe it back off. So the other thing we wanted to show you was kind of our setup here. Um, so we're working on a board called a Homa Soap board. Um, and it is uh, kind of like a compressed fiber sort of board. So it does make it nice because we can pin into the board, and I, I don't know, you know about you, Val, but I mean, you can pin into this thing like a million times probably, yeah, yeah. and it just will hold up. So it's it's really kind of hard to to uh, destroy it. And then we're just gonna, you know, stick it in with some push pins. These layout blocks are um, something that we sell, and you yeah. can see that they come in different sizes. So depending on the size of your project, I brought this one because this is my favorite. If you can see, it has a, a lot of smaller pieces, although they dummy come in different lengths, which is also nice. But if you get the smaller ones, I think it's more versatile, don't you? Because it's not like we're framing the whole thing. It's like basically we're going to put one in front of every joint like so that so that if your pieces are a little tight or not fitting real well, this will hold it in place. You can kind of push them in, get them tight and then these will hold them in place because otherwise once you start soldering you could move them out and you know then you're yes. then you're kind of in a mess and you have to and what's also important is that you know our, our plan is we're going to put a zinc frame around the outside of this panel 
Uh, we're not going to do that today, but we'll do it in our next uh, presentation. And you want the outside edge to be nice and straight so that it's just easier to get that zinc around the outside. And again, the layout blocks really help you do that. And you know, I'm with you too. I think the, oh, the block just needs to cover wherever there's a seam, you know, mm -hmm. wherever you have you know, a couple of pieces coming together. So we have that all pinned down, ready to go. Um, I guess the next thing we talked about, I've mentioned the word flux a couple times. I'm not sure if you know what it is, but flux is a chemical that we're going to put on and sort of paint onto the copper to, it does a couple things. One is it will um, clean any oxidation off of the copper. Uh, you know, just the copper just sitting around will oxidize a tiny bit, and um, so the acid that's in the flux will clean that off. The other thing a flux does is it helps the solder to just uh, melt a little smoother and flow a little easier. So a flux does those couple of things. If you look down here, you'll see we have like a wide uh, different uh, variety of brands of fluxes, and I, uh, you know, I used to wonder like why in the heck do we carry like you know so many fluxes? But I, I know it's personal, you know. It's just a personal thing. I think some people like a certain brand of flux, and to them, that's the best flux ever. Um, I don't think I have a, a what favorite. Are you, don't you use ruby fluid? You yeah, used I used to, to use ruby fluid all the yeah, time. Yeah, and I always yeah. used um, I always used the gel because that's what I was taught with. So I think it doesn't really. They all do the same yeah. thing. You just have to kind of get used to working with whatever consistency it is, right? I agree with that. Too yeah. much liquid, I mean, the, the ruby fluid's very thin. It's like water, which is one of the main ones that that cutting the brush down does some, is really advantageous because it's so, yeah. thin, so thin. But, um, and then you've been using this one, I use this one. The glass star is one yeah, I started out using. Yeah, so I don't know, know. they're all, they're it's, good. A, it's all, they're all yeah. acid yeah. type. Yeah. Yeah. Flux. So. I'll tell you, they all work, right? And so that was we've said it. Just I guess whatever one you think works better for you, and I guess that's what the one you need to use. So I have a little bit here. One of our recommendations is that you don't um, dip directly into the bottle because you might contaminate all the flux that's in there. And what I mean by contaminate is I think it just shortens the life of it. You know, as you kind of you know get junk back in there, then eventually the the flux isn't as um, effective is probably a good way of putting it. So normally we put the flux somewhere else. Sometimes I have a little dish uh, that I use at home. Uh, here a lot of times we'll just, I use a piece of glass as like a palette and I just, you know, pour a little on. Especially with the... Yeah, especially these ones that are a little thicker, right? Yeah. They, they work pretty well. And then we're gonna come in and, and grab a little bit of flux. So uh, I, I take some on here and then I usually find another spot and knock off the excess flux, you know, somewhere else. Sometimes, you know, if I was on a dish, I might scrape it along the edge to off I just don't want a lot of flux on here as I mentioned earlier it, it's easy for me to dip back in and, and get more um, now what we're gonna do is come in and just cover wherever two uh, lines foiled pieces meet we're gonna cover with some flux um, it is not like painting you know you don't have to do this and <laughs> spend five minutes trying to make sure you get everything right just come in cover it and move on to the next thing I do flux heavier than that you do I know I don't, I'm pretty late fluxer. You are. So are you going to tack first? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, the first thing, I think Val and I were talking a little bit earlier, we, we were trying to make sure that we, as we mentioned in some of our previous presentations, that, you know, there's not like one right, perfect way to do this, and everybody probably approaches it a little differently, but I think for the most part, uh, Val and I, we solder uh, pretty similar. similar. We have similar ideas, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, we both said that the way we start out is we do some tack soldering, and tack soldering would just be... Um, what I'm going to try to do is just add a small glob of solder between two pieces of glass and just to kind of hold everything in place. So the tack soldering then makes sure that everything's where I want it to be and I don't have to worry about, as Val had mentioned earlier, bumping a piece and sliding it out of the yeah. way or something. And then once it's all tacked, and you do this as well, right, then these come off. Yep. I see so once this is all tacked, one piece at least attached to another piece, then you can take these blocks off and it's not going to move out of place. And these layout blocks really are very, they're really helpful, but they're really temporary the way yeah. we do it because yeah. now if we were going to leave these on and try to solder the whole thing, I can't, they're in my way. I can't get my hand down because what I really am going to want to do is get in there and get this to actually cross that, those two pieces of glass with this main part of the iron where, I, where I'm going to get adequate heat to do the job all at once. And if these things are in my way, it causes me to sort of do that tipping thing, like we said, isn't as efficient, right? Yeah, yeah that's so. a good way of putting it. 
Okay, I had to do that. Now. No, you, that was you good. can tap. Now. No, that was real good. Um, well, I think maybe we'll talk about solder real quick. I think we should maybe okay. get into the different types of solders. You know, there, there's a few different um, types of solders on the market. What I'm holding in my hand is uh, one. So they refer to solders by a number. This is a what they call a 6040 um, solder. So it's 60% tin, 40% lead. And then there's a 5050, which I Guess think is what? pretty obvious. That's, I don't probably have to explain that one. Um, there's another solder that people ask about a lot of times. It's a 6337 solder. So 63% um, tin, 37% uh, lead. And the question is, why is it such a specific you know, percentage? And it is a solder that has a really, really short working range. So the melting temperature and the temperature which it sets up are almost identical. And so the advantage to like the 6337 is uh, decorative soldering. You know, people use a lot of times when yeah. they're doing decorative soldering, where you're trying to leave marks in the solder you do on purpose. Swirls and, yeah. yeah, it can get pretty elaborate. Some I do it like sometimes on, when if I'm doing a sun catcher and I want to do the outside edge of the sun catcher. You know, sometimes they're kind of awkward to solder. So the 6337 will set up almost immediately. So it's less likely to kind of drip off on you and it will mm -hmm. kind of stay in place. Um, 50 50, like I mentioned before, it's, you know, half lead, half tin. and um, I know that uh, lead cane people use that a lot of times just because the color is a little closer to lead, right, to the full lead. Uh, I know lamp makers also use uh, a 50-50 sometime as their initial soldering just to fill in holes uh, because it sets up a little quicker. I was going to say, yeah, because it uh, does set up a little quicker than the 60-40. Yep. And, uh, well, we use the 60-40 for doing this type of work because the 60-40 solder has the longest working range meaning that you know where it melts and where it sets up, it's a longer range. So the thinking is, it should be easier to get um, smooth looking solder seams, which I think is the goal, right? Is to get all of our seams looking really nice and smooth. And we think 6040 gives us that best chance to do that. And there are some lead-free solders on the, on the market. So if you're interested in those, they, are, they tend to be almost pure tin. They have some other um, metals in there besides tin, but for the most but part- But no lead. Yeah, but no lead. And, um, they have a higher working temperature. So if you're used to working with the lead solders, you'll find that the um, lead-free ones feel stiffer. And it's only because you probably should, you know, work with a slightly hotter iron with those. Yes, for sure. <clears throat> they're, and they're a little trickier to work with. So would this be a good time to talk a little bit about um, the flux versus the solder in terms of fumes? Yeah, yeah, let's talk because about I that. Because I think that's, that's one the, of the things people sometimes are a little bit Mis that misunderstand yes. a little bit. Yeah. Real quick before we jump, okay. what would be the benefits of what you would use the lead free for? Oh, well, you know, the, a, a couple things. And one, the, probably the most simple one is if you have some, you know, real concern or an issue with uh, uh, being exposed to lead, um, that would be a reason to probably not, you know, to use a lead free. And handling, which is what we were just going to yeah. get to, that the handling of something that has lead solder on it automatically puts a bit of a residue of lead on your hand. So kaleidoscopes, things that people- Jewelry. Jewelry, yeah, jewelry in particular, that people yeah. handle. Yeah, boxes um, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess it depends. Anything in a children's room, a lot of times we'd say, you know, if you're doing something that was gonna hang in the window of a, of a kid's room, you might wanna use a lead free for that. So yeah, the, as we're sort of hinting about is that the lead that's in the solder, um, we don't breathe in lead fumes. So during this um, soldering process, the, the misconception is that we are breathing in some kind of lead fumes, but we're actually not getting the lead hot enough to turn into a vapor. So the issue is with lead is consuming it, is getting it in your system, in your body. Yeah, and and so if it's on your hands and then you're you know eating a sandwich or doing something like that, you can see where you can get it inside your body. So for the most part, uh, the, the safety thing with, with solder is a simple wash your hands when you're done, right? Or with the lead, with this, yeah, exactly. But it's the fumes and the, from the flux that yes. can tend to be nasty. Yes, yeah, exactly. So the, the concern with soldering is the, the fumes from the flux. So when you when you hear people talking about things like, you know, work in a well-ventilated room, I would agree with that, right? Absolutely. And if you can open a window, that's nice. We sometimes recommend if you could put a small fan on your table so it blows this way across and not up at you this mm -hmm. way, right? Um, that's another way because- And don't just, you can't just do it like <laughs> this either. I mean, if you have to do that, you maybe need to get glasses, right? Yeah, because yeah. that's really definitely not good. Yeah, because what you'll see, uh, if you see anything come up while we're soldering, it is, the, it is the flux burning off and not the lead. And so, as I mentioned earlier, it's one reason why I personally try to use as small amount of flux as possible.
because um, again, yeah. if you don't have to breathe that Makes in, sense, right, you might as well try to avoid it. Um, okay, good. Was I just that good? To make sure, sure we got that. Yeah, and That's again, it. if you have questions about the safety, just you know, feel free to get a hold of us. Mm -hmm. so we, we think we covered it okay. I think so. so Yes. One of the other tips um, I know we often recommend mm -hmm. is getting a separate soldering tip if you are going to be doing oh, lead free. Mm -hmm. So I did want to just touch on that real quick. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's true. We do recommend that because this, well, well, you might not know this, but when you buy a soldering iron, it already has solder on the tip. The tip has been tinned is the terminology and it, because it is a lead free solder that's on the tip. And so it's the first time you use it, you contaminate it because you've used lead free. And so it's probably, that's probably some good advice is to have a separate tip that we would only do the lead free with. So I'm gonna do the tack soldering. Again, I wanna show you how I'm holding the iron. You'll notice that this is what they refer to as a chisel tip. So there's like two flat sides to it, two larger flat sides. And I wanna hold the iron with the flat sides straight up and down, not flat onto the surface like this, but here for a couple of reasons. One is because this nice flat area is gonna give me a spot to feed solder into. But also when the iron is like this, it helps draw the solder up a little bit and it makes it a little easier to get rounded looking solder seams and not flat looking mm -hmm. ones. Would you? Yeah, I would agree. So I'm gonna come in and um, I'm gonna feed a little uh, solder into the tip. Again, wherever two pieces of glass meet, I'm just gonna put down a little bit of solder. Again, I don't re really even care what it looks like. Yeah. Um, and one of the other things I think, you know, when, when we teach, you know, you, we find out what some of the issues are people sort of struggle with. And one of them too is that they're afraid to touch the glass with the oh, soldering. Oh yeah, that's a good tip. point. And you have to, you, you know, you have to. Now you don't want to lay it there and leave it there for five minutes because yes, you could crack your glass if it gets hot enough. But, but initially you've got to see. Yeah. So you one thing you can do it down uh, on purpose, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. So the one thing you can I, maybe uh, it's probably hard to tell from the video, but as Val's mentioning, I'm actually touching the glass when I do this. You know, with the, with this, I'm not like hovering above it and trying to drip onto it. Mm -hmm. I just touch the um, the glass. Now here, if you can see what's going on here, I don't know how well you can see this. I I did not flux this area because I wanted you to see what the solder looks like when it's not fluxed. Right? Do you see how it's not really wanting to flow? It's not grabbing the copper real well. It's nice and spiky. But if you look at these other ones, you see how nicely they melt in. That's because it's fluxed. Now, again, I didn't flux on purpose because I wanted you to see what that looked like. So I can just come in here now and just hit that with this a little bit of flux and then touch it and then it will just melt and get all nice and smooth. You see that? And you probably also saw a little smoke come up. That was the, that's the flux burning off. We have a question from Lori. What do you think of flux without acid? Oh, well, I mean, they were. Uh, uh, they're not as, um, uh, personally, I found them to be just a little more of a challenge, especially if you're trying to work quickly or get long, you know, uh, solder seams where you're trying to get a real long bead of solder that looks nice and smooth. They tend to be um, a little stiffer, maybe it's a better way of kind right. of putting it not allowing the solder to melt and flow, but they certainly are far safer. And so sometimes, you know, when it comes, again, when it comes to safety, uh, sometimes you have to compromise a little bit, right, to, uh, mm -hmm. to what you're trying to do. Or if you use the, the real flux, then you just have to practice the safety precautions and I think you're fine too, so. The, um, uh, so then now it's all tack soldered together, if you can see that, right? So for the most part, any, anywhere two pieces meet, I've, I've tried to put just a little ball of um, solder on there. Um, we're gonna pull off the. Yeah, we need a crowbar. You don't need a crowbar. Yes, I push some of the pins in pretty, pretty, pretty hard. I guess. Okay. I just do this. Look at this, and I pry it up. Look at that. Isn't that nice? I guess I can say what I want so, to. I know. Um, so, so if you can see it here. Oh, something. The other thing too is people. I get asked this a lot of times. Oh, they're yeah. like, oh, you're soldering right on top of the pattern. Yeah, I always solder on the pattern because I want to make sure my, my pieces are fitting the design that I want, right? I mean, this one's a pretty simple design, but you can imagine on a more complicated one, it helps to know exactly where the pieces need to go and what the pattern looks like. We are not gonna set the pattern on fire, right? We're not getting anywhere near hot enough to do that. You might get a little flux on it or something like that, but for the most part, the pattern's unharmed. Yeah. But you can see how easily the panel moves, right? Um, even with this little tack soldering. And a panel this small, you know, I can probably even pick it up, right? And it stays together. But you gotta support it every <clears throat> else yeah. you can rip your floor. So. But normally, you're, I mean, anything bigger than this, you wouldn't be able to pick up, obviously. But the, the advantage is gonna be 
the reason why we tack solder is because now since it's together, I can move the panel wherever I want. I, I kind of refer to it as similar to like cutting glass, where sometimes you, you turn the glass so it's easier to cut it, right? Especially if you're doing a curve. Soldering is similar to me is where I can turn the panel when I'm trying to solder because it makes it a little bit easier. And I'll show you that as we kind of get going. So normally, what at this point, Val, don't you, uh, you go in and get all the gaps, right? Is that the type yeah. of thing that you would do? Mm -hmm. So if you look at here, I mean, we um, purposely left a lot of, <laughs> a lot a lot of, of good, some spaces. We left some spaces just so you could see that. And then these are nothing. I mean, these are pretty s small in the in the, in yeah, the, the scheme of yeah, things. Yeah, in the right? scheme of things, yeah. right? So I'm going to hit these with just a little bit more flux only because I use such a small amount. And, and the fact that we're also just kind of standing up here talking, some of the flux evaporates. And so I'm just hitting, especially these areas. But the first thing then that we normally do is go into anywhere there's a gap. And uh, I'll do this one over here. And uh, we're just going to fill it with solder. And the, the, the purpose here is just to get solder in there. I don't, I don't even care what it looks like. So I'm not trying to make it look smooth or I'm not trying to, you know, no. make it look fancy i'm just trying to fill, fill the space yeah. right so just think of spilling filling the space um i got one here that's kind of nice it's kind of big it's all right what we're doing here is if i try to make this look nice right if I, so if i spent the time to make this look like a nice smooth solder seam it would be too hot and the solder would get too fluid and the solder will just melt through to the backside. So by doing all the gaps first, I'm giving these an opportunity to cool down so that now when I go solder on top of it, it'll act kind of like a blockage so the solder won't be as likely to, to bleed through to the other side is the term that we use. Right? Yeah, because that is a pro that's one of the problems with people that are new too is that they keep going over the same spot over and over because yeah. they're trying to make it look nice. And then what ultimately happens is the glass starts getting hot and then now the glass is so hot it won't let the solder cool off. Wow, sorry, sorry about that. We, I don't know what, uh, hopefully that wasn't too bad. We had some little feedback on our speaker, sorry. Um, here's another situation that where I'm trying to do the uh, filling in the gap, right? And do you see how the solder is globbing here well, or yeah. kind of spilling over the, the where the foil is at? Not enough flux, mm -hmm. right? So easy to come in, hit it with a little flux, and then if I come back with the iron, I can then come in and see how easily that melts and then brings it right back and, up. and brings it right back to where I want it to go. It's like magic. <laughs> it's a lot like magic, right? That's what I say. I always say if you're if you're soldering and all of a sudden it just stops working right and you can't your solder's not flowing and yep. you know, it's just hit it up with a little flux and you'll be surprised that's probably what the problem is. Yeah, I tell people a lot of times you probably don't even have to dip back into the flux. Yeah. There's probably enough flux on your brush that all you have to do is just hit it, you know, with it and then, then continue. Um, I was going to just show, maybe try to do a nice looking solder seam, is that right? Normally yeah. what uh, we would do is, again, uh, tack solder was first thing, second then would be fill in gaps, and then the third thing then is to try to work the seams and, and try to make them look nice. Um, on one side, and then we would flip over and do the other. Uh, I'm not sure how much we're gonna yeah, we're gonna do today. I think you sort of get the point of what we're doing. But uh, let me show you. Uh, for example, let's say I'm gonna do this seam here. Uh, if I hold the iron here, see how much not much of the tip actually covers that. So for me, it's easier to turn it this way. And now, do you see where the iron is at? I want to be like perpendicular to the solder seam. I want as much of the this is oh, the other thing too that we get asked a lot about is, you know, well, why do you have such a big, you know, um, tip to your soldering iron? And it's because I want it to cover as much of the foil as possible, right? If I have a small tip, it doesn't cover as much of the foil. And sometimes you might find yourself having to go back once or twice to, um, to cover the, the copper. My goal is, because I'm lazy, is to, um, I, I really want to just put down one seam and then, and and then walk away from it, yeah. Oh, let me just show you one other thing real quick. You see how I'm holding the solder? You want to pull out about six inches or so of solder as you're working, right? Not doing this, right? If I'm working like this and then soldering from here, the next time I have to grab some solder, you can imagine the tip, of the iron, the solder is going to be hot, right? So give yourself at least a few inches so you have something to work with. And again, you'll see me periodically and wiping on the, on the sponge to keep the tip clean. So now I'm kind of perpendicular to this. I'm going to come in here and just add some solder. So I don't know how well you can see, but I'm feeding solder here into the, and flat, side. Into the flat side. And then in this situation, I'm pulling. 
right? So going towards the camera, I guess. Mm -hmm. See that you do do it opposite of the way I do it. Oh, well, so we came across something we do different. Uh -huh. I just do it exactly like that way. I can start at the top and come back towards me. Yeah, yeah, I know. I can tell you that. Um, I, a lot of times when I'm demonstrating soldering in a class, and people say, "Well, which direction do you go?" Mm -hmm. and I say, "I have no idea. I think <laughs> it's just whatever that scene looks like to me." So sometimes I'm doing this, which I showed you here, where I feed in this and I'm dragging this way. I think what Val was talking about was sometimes I feed it here, but I'll drag it back this way. Mm -hmm. The thing that also that you probably can't tell is I'm looking behind the iron, maybe about an inch and a half or so and looking at the solder. So I don't know if you noticed, but I was not continually feeding solder in. I was soldering, and then when I saw the solder start to get a little flat, then I would add a little bit more. Uh, and so I, that's my way of trying to prevent Absolutely. myself that's, from using yeah. too much that's what solder, I do too. right? Yeah, it's easier. Let me show you just for the fun of it what a flat solder seam looks like, right? So it was the, sometimes, um, they refer to this as a bead. I just read that the other day that you know uh, the solder seam. They, they refer to it as a bead, and what they mean by that is just again that we're looking for something. I don't know how well you can see this. It's slightly rounded, right? Yeah. It should just mm -hmm. come up over the surface a little bit. If you look at this one, you'll see how flat it is. So if you can sort of see in between, you know, like where the two pieces of glass meet, you don't have enough solder, right? We we want this nice kind of rounded sort of look to it. The other thing you might notice is you, you notice how I'm not soldering all the way to the very outside edge here. You know, we plan on putting some uh, copper or zinc around the outside as a frame, and that has to slide onto the glass. So, um, well, if I can get it in there. It's hard, but we can't. I know when you don't have the whole thing. Mm -hmm. There it goes. But you sort of get the idea, right? So I have to slide that on there, and I don't want to put a big glob of solder that will interfere with me getting this on later. So I always just back off on all the, the sides where the joints mm -hmm. leave on the side there. Now, this flat one easy to fix. You know, one of the things I, you know, about solder, I'm, you might agree with me on this, Val, is that, you know, there's, uh, it's pretty easy to fix. And, you know, Val made a really nice comment that, you know, if you hang around too long and get it too hot, that's probably not a good thing. I have a real simple rule for me is, I mean, if you can't touch it because it's so hot, then it's too hot to solder back in. And so just, exactly. I, think you, I think you mentioned I go this. somewhere else. If I think it's too hot, get too hot, I'll put a finger on each side of it. Um, if you can't leave your finger there for like two seconds, then you need to keep the iron off of that pot for a while. Yeah, the temptation is to try to make it look better, uh -huh. but really in the long run, it's better just to sometimes to go somewhere else on the panel and then come back, right? Yeah. So go ahead, Moses, go ahead and, and yep. run some more seams and see. We have some thicker spots, which is what the bleed through will look like. But if you do a little bit more, yeah. we'll be able to flip it over and you'll be able to yeah. see what that looks like. Yeah. I don't think we're going to do the whole panel, but let me do a little bit more just so you can kind of see what we're doing. Um, but one thing I wanted to comment was you'll notice that hopefully when I'm soldering, uh, I'm not moving the iron a lot, right? It's not, you know, this kind of yeah, a thing where I'm bit. like painting or something, you know, right? The, the smoother you can move your iron, the smoother the solder seam is going to be. So I got probably a lot of solder there, but. And, and the speed in which you move your iron is totally dependent on the solder melting. So if you move your iron too fast, you're just gonna spread it out and it's not gonna work. And so you have to kind of wait for the solder to melt, especially when we go back and start going through some of these cold spots now, right? You yeah, exactly, to, yeah. You know, yeah, you have to give the solder a chance to, mm -hmm. to melt, right? Now I'm noticing, Roy, as you are soldering, you're pulling your soldering iron onto the glass once you're done. Can you explain right. that? Yeah, so when I'm trying to leave uh, the um, where I'm soldering, right? So the tendency is you, you're soldering something, you get to a point and then you pick straight up. I, I think sometimes that leaves a mark. Uh, in the it glass, did. or it sometimes sent, it sent like chill marks. Yeah, all the way or back. sometimes it leaves a like a little spiky thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, so when I'm soldering, um, I'll just hit this one again real quick. Is uh, when I'm soldering a, a joint, instead of pulling straight up, I always pull off. There's something going on there. Uh, pull off to the side like this. Uh, so where where the where the solder's still molten, and then I pull off that way, and it tends to just 
kind of heel back up and roll right back over. Again, pulling straight up sometimes causes a little bit of a mark, and again, Let's I don't know how big the deal is, so. Let's do that one up there, and then I think we could flip it. Yeah, then let me, uh, we can talk about this too, how it, um, so the tendency is when you start to get all these lines kind of meeting at the same place, the tendency is to do this and come in and solder, and then when you get right here, you pull your iron up, and do you see how that leaves a little bit larger of a glob or mass of solder? Part of it is because the other solders are cold and that just kind of sits on top of it. The other part is because I'm dragging excess solder and it just, when I pull my iron out, it all just pools right there. So sometimes uh, what I'll do on these, again, I'm gonna, uh, the rule is, I think we've said it a few times, but if you're ever gonna solder back in is, again, just hit it with a little flux, right? Because it will uh, just melt a little easier. Make sure your tip is nice and clean. So I'm gonna come in and heat up this area pull through it all to get it nice and molten, and then I'm gonna drag some of it over here. Do you see how that uh, mm -hmm. minimizes the, how, uh, what a larger glob that looked like, and it looks a little more delicate, and I've smoothed things out. Um, mm -hmm. Is that? Yeah, looks good. Looks pretty good, good, mm -hmm. great. We're gonna flip it over. Let's assume that we had soldered the whole front of the panel, and then we're gonna uh, flip it over and do the back side. And um, you can see here that where the bigger spaces yeah were. somewhere the larger gaps are the solder's already come through which was which is kind of nice now right because it's filled in that gap so typically i always think the back goes easier because all those holes are already filled in <laughs> yeah right? They, right and i always tell people you practice on the front so now you have yeah. a little more you can sort of have a better feel for what you're doing same deal here i'm not going to do probably this whole this whole part of the this whole side but let's uh um we'll do a little bit of it oh yeah oh yeah yeah I, i've um You've seen me, pro or maybe heard me even uh, on the sponge here as I continually try to wipe the tip off as I'm working, but eventually the sponge won't clean everything off. As I mentioned before, we get impurities in the solder and the flux burning off will sometimes leave some black gunk on the tip of this. So one of the things you want to invest in is something called a tinning block, or it's a salomoniac block it's called. Again, the term tinning just means recoating something with solder. And you can see this is what it looks like when it's brand new. And then you can see this is the one we've been using in our classroom for a little while, and you can see all the black gunk that it burns off the iron. I can show you real uh, quickly here how that works. So while your iron is plugged in and hot, you want to come on to this and just start rubbing it on there back and forth, and um, you're going to burn off any any of that black sort of junk that's on there. And again, do every side, right? They're, technically, your, your tip has four sides, so you wanna get all four sides. The other thing that helps too is, some, is just add a tiny bit of solder to the tip and then continue to rub it. Um, and as that solder kind of flows around, it helps get off some of that. You know, often people come in with um, soldering irons that aren't heating anymore and they didn't ever know anything about this salomoniac block. And, you know, we'll take it in the classroom and spend a few minutes on it, and it really wasn't the tip that yeah, was bad. It was just that it was so gunked up. It just yeah. couldn't heat. So, you know, it's really, you know, I wouldn't say you do it every time you solder, but, you know, every yeah. few times yep. just to get that burnt on residue is a good idea. Yeah, I would think every two or three projects, right? Again, depending on the size of the project, I guess. But. I can't remember if I flexed this. I think I did, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Well, we'll find out whether I flexed it or not here pretty soon. And as Val mentioned before, it you know this side we don't need to tack solder it, or we don't need to fill in gaps because all that's already done for us. Um, often I don't even flux that much on this side because often it's already come through too a little Val's bit. Val's a radical. Ooh, that's pretty. That was a good one. Thanks. <laughs> now, I saw you got some solder on the glass. What do you do to take care oh, of that? Oh, yeah. Don't, don't worry about that. What it is, is. Don't um, touch it. It's yeah, hot. Yeah. First of all, don't touch it. Don't try to pick it up, which people do. Um, don't. One thing I see people do, too, which I don't think is a good idea, is don't try to pick it up with the tip of the iron. People are like, I'll just remelt it and grab it on the tip. But, again, you run the risk of getting the glass so hot that it cracks. Um, and you know, unfortunately, a lot of times you don't see those cracks until you're cleaning it up, and then you think, oh, I did something in the cleaning process, and really it happened while you were soldering sometimes. So um, you can thermal shock the glass. Uh, normally what we do is, I don't know about you, Val, but I just leave it to the very end. I don't even yeah. worry about it, because I know it's not gonna stick to the glass. Mm -hmm. The solder only sticks to where the foil is at. It's sticking now because it's hot, but once it cools off, it'll just pop right off, so, sort of. It's still warm, though, that's yes. why. 
when it, you're right. When it's yeah, cool, I mean, it's it'll, cool, it'll, yeah. it'll, you can I mean, get this, them all. So the, here's another thing, too, that's a good question. Is So when I'm feeding solder into my iron, I don't know if you can tell, but I don't do it over my panel. You know, I'm doing it over here because the reason is if it if I do drip, you know, then it drips on the table and not onto my panel, right? Um, not that, again, I mean, this is one reason that just helps keep it a little cleaner by not having dripping solder on your panel, so. Uh, so then we're going to come in here, except here where I'm feeding it, obviously, right into where I'm putting the iron. So I'm going to come in. And as Val mentioned earlier, that sometimes on these, you have to go even a hair slower because there's solder on there and we want to melt that solder and, and take it with us. So um, it takes just a second longer to do that. Again, you'll see when I stop here, I've left a nice little kind of blob of solder, but I, but I don't really care because I, I have to solder elsewhere and I'll just drag some of that mm -hmm. solder with me when I go. Uh, for example, I could come over here, reheat this, um, get it melting and then start pulling it over to this seam which needs you know some solder so but that is it you're watching so you're watching that rounded bead so when that starts to when you start stretching it out too thin is when you start adding again so you didn't add there for a couple minutes until, yeah you know, yeah that so, had a nice glob I could yeah. pull around so yeah so it's just a it's just a practice thing you know you get, to get the feel of it after a while yeah. but it is fun it's one yeah. of my favorite things to do well, you know, my advice I always tell people about soldering is the only people that really care about good soldering are probably you and your stained glass friends. But, you know, the average person doesn't know what good soldering is. So, uh, again, I'm not saying to do a poor job, but usually we're a little pickier than I think mm -hmm. we need to be sometimes with the soldering. Uh, and again, if you, you want to go back in and touch it up, you should just, you know, give it a chance to kind of cool down a little bit, right? Right. So we should hit the cleaning? Yeah, we're, yeah, we're just going to wrap up here. But one thing we want to talk about is cleaning just a little bit. So our next presentation is going to be about what we call finishing. Mm -hmm. In and, about um, in the next two weeks? Yeah, I think that's what we're saying. Probably in about two weeks is when we hope to do it. So the July 14th, I think, was close to the date, right? Is that what we said? Yeah. We'll be and, posting it on Instagram and Facebook oh, so you guys can tune in. Definitely. Mm -hmm. But um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about finishing there, about putting the camera on the outside and maybe even a wood frame, that type of thing. Putting rings on to hang it. Oh, yeah, it. to put rings yeah. on to hang it. But for uh, today, what we wanted to talk about at least was cleaning your panel real quick because let's pretend that, you know, I'm soldering this and I'm not going to be able to get to it till later today or even tomorrow or in a few days even, and I want to finish the soldering. We can't leave the flux onto the glass because the flux is an acid and it will start to oxidize and cause some problems. And, it'll make it difficult to solder back into. So we wanna clean the panel before we do anything else. We have a variety of cleaning products here. Um, Neutral Clean makes one. This is a um, one from Quick Clean. Is that the and one that you spray and you don't have to rinse? Yeah, the advantage of this yeah. one is you don't have to rinse it off. So I, I tell you, it comes in uh, handy when you have a really large panel and you can't necessarily drag it to a sink to, to um, uh, rinse it off. Or I was doing a repair job the other day and you know, so it's a big panel and there was no reason to get the whole thing clean or, or wet even. I just was soldering a little bit. So this, I just had to clean up in that one spot. That comes in real handy. Otherwise, uh, this one, or um, we have a CJ's Flux Remover and a yeah. Val's Grabbing, another one. These are both kind of like soaps. And so you would uh, use water. And our recommendation is a soft um, bristled brush to scrub your panel because if you soldered it correctly, you probably have these slightly raised solder seams. And if you're just using like a rag or a paper towel, you're not gonna get into all the little nooks and crannies. So use a small brush, uh, like a nail brush, or we use like a vegetable brush, you might call it, right? With, uh, we didn't bring one in to show you, but I think you no, get the idea. We even use the, I use the... The one they use for lead cane? Uh -huh. Yeah, we saw one here for doing uh, doing the lead cane work, you know, putting the putty in or the whitey. Uh, that a, works it's great. It's a nice bristle. Yeah, I like it's that a natural brush. bristle brush, which I think is probably, a, that way you don't have to worry about scratching the glass. You're not going to scratch the glass with it. But otherwise, you would get your panel wet, add the soap to it, and then scrub it and rinse it off, right? And then let it dry. The, the, all of the cleaners neutralize the acid that's in the flux, and that's probably the most important thing, right? Is we, they're a base, so they neutralize the acid, and then we don't have to worry about any strange oxidation right. occurring. Right. We've got a couple questions coming in. Uh, Helena is asking about the 63 solder type. So I think she means the 63% tin, 37% lead. Yes. We've got it here in Mastercraft, but I do believe Canfield also makes one as well. Canfield does, yeah. We've got both of those. Um, Patricia is asking, where can I get a good pencil tip iron? 
So we sell a variety of different soldering irons and tip sizes. So are you looking for a small one? Um, I know Weller has got, um, we use it often for boxes. It's got like a yeah. joint tip. Um, so it's very narrow. It is not yeah. um, a chisel like this. Yeah, so if you see this tip is a three eighths inch tip and then for the Weller, you can replace the tip, which is really nice because they have a, a quarter inch tip and I think even a um, three sixteenths. So there's a couple of different smaller sizes. Yeah. So again, if you need a smaller tip for doing something, and that's a good um, question there's this. because I, I actually learned about a smaller tip, oh, and when I came here, I thought, oh my gosh, that's huge. So it, it has a lot to do. If you're doing a panel like this, that's a really nice size tip because it carries a nice amount of solder. You don't have to keep feeding. But for other things, like next week when we or whenever we put the rings on, that big fat tip sometimes is a yeah, little bit problematic. Yeah. So. There are, I get it, but there are people doing certain things where a smaller tip would probably be, be much easier to use. And once again, they do make them. I mean, well, but you know, I, I know we showed this Hako one earlier, and I don't know how well you can see the tip on that, but that's a pretty small, little delicate tip. I know um, somebody that works here she does a lot of boxes, and she likes this one because you can get inside the seams and things. And it, you know, again, it works well for any kind of sewing, yeah. really. Wonderful. So if you have any more questions you know, or if you think of something after we're done, right, just again, send us a message on Facebook or Instagram, or you can always email us at Facebook at DelphiGlass.com. If you want to look at some of our past videos, they're on our um, video section of our Facebook page, or you can always check out our YouTube channel. We'll see um, if we can patch this one together before we upload it to YouTube yeah. for you guys. Great. Well, thanks for, for watching. Yep. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next time.